in, in, uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Greg Sanders from Mineral, from Mineral Management Service. Uh, Greg graduated from UCSB with a degree in aquatic biology. Uh, he worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a coordinator for the Southern Otter Recovery and Translocation Program. I'll be talking about sea otters. He's currently the Pacific Regions Marine Mammal and Sea Otter Biologist for Minerals Management Service. So please welcome Greg Sanders. Greg. Thanks, Bill. Uh, what uh, Bill failed to mention in the introduction is that I also worked here at Channel Islands National Park for a short time. It was actually my first federal job. Uh, back in uh, 1987, and uh, it was great. I actually did an internship um, when I was up at University of California at Santa Barbara with the National Park, and that turned into a job which turned into a career. After I left the Park Service, I went to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service where I spent about 18 years, and, then I, and now I'm still with the Department of Interior in uh, what's known as the Minerals Management Service. We deal with offshore oil and gas development as well as renewable energy offshore, and I'm their marine mammal and seabird person. So I still get to get um, uh, dabble in sea otters, uh, as they are one of the marine mammals, and, uh, and get other interesting projects as well. So, I recognize several faces here. Um, how many of you have been to one of my presentations before? Okay, great. Well, this is a little bit different than the previous presentations. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute. But I wanted to say why I'm here. First of all, uh, I'm here because it's a short sea lecture series. And it's a great series, and I love to be back and doing it. Uh, the other reason is, is there was an event last week. Does anyone know what the event was? You know, I heard about that last night. It's the first time I heard about a lawsuit, uh, but there's lots of lawsuits flying around. So, no, that's not what I was thinking of. Last week was Sea Otter Awareness Week. Sea Otter Awareness Week. <laughs> you didn't get that one? <laughs> well, actually, I was asked by Defenders of Wildlife, um, the, the nonprofit group that uh, is very interested in wildlife. They started out with wolves, and they've expanded out much further than that. And uh, friends of mine at Defenders of Wildlife asked if I could speak about Sea Otters for Sea Otter Awareness Week. So we're a little late with Sea Otter Awareness Week, but we're still making it and giving you some more information on Sea Otters uh, this week. Sea Otter Awareness Week is recognized by the state of California. The state legislature passed a bill to say this is Sea Otter Awareness Week. I don't know how many other awareness things are going on that week because it seems like there's only so many weeks in a year that we can be aware. But, <laughs> Um, well, I'll say also is that um, for those of us that pay taxes, how many of that, uh, those are, a lot of people are paying taxes, no one wants to admit to it, but they are paying taxes. Uh, on the state tax forms, you might notice those check boxes at the bottom. There's a number of worthy causes on the bottom of that check form, check boxes. If you hadn't noticed, there's a sea under one on there too. And that's because of efforts of Defenders of Wildlife. So I wanted to acknowledge that. So. What's different about tonight's talk compared to previous talks? Well, the, uh, about four years ago when I was doing the Shore Sea Lecture Series, I talked about the Sea Otter Translocation Program and, and also Sea Otters moving south along the coast. They are still working their way south and they haven't really come into Ventura too much, but we do see them fairly regularly in the Santa Barbara area now. It's not unusual to see a sea otter there, but it's still not very common. Last year, I came and talked about the historical perspective about sea otters and the history of California and, and what, what it really meant to this area, which I still find very fascinating, and I hope you found that that, that, saw, it, that saw it last year. This year, I'm actually going to go to very basic questions, um, because I get the same questions all the time, and I want you to be able to tell Family and friends, and impress your friends at school down here with your knowledge of sea otters. Very basic knowledge, but I'll tell you some other tidbits along the way, which I think will make it a little bit more interesting. So, with that, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So, this is actually me. <laughs> it's a little younger and a little less heavy at that time. Um, <laughs> 
but uh, anyway, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, talk about my first question. What does a sea otter look like? This seems like a very basic question, but you'd be surprised at how many people, including people that I would expect know what a sea otter looks like, don't. And I have to pass along one of my favorite stories. I was uh, working on San Nicolas Island. We had taken a number of otters out to San Nicolas Island, and we were trying to figure out what was happening with them. Many of them were leaving the island and so on. And while I was off the island, a person that was involved with harbor seal research on the island looking at pupping of harbor seals on the island, called me up and said they found a sea otter on the beach, and uh, was I interested in picking up? Well, certainly I was. I flew out there, and I uh, went to this freezer they had in and pulled up in a bag, and there was a nice, fresh harbor seal pupping. <laughs> and so I thought, well, they're studying harbor seals, so you know, that must be one of the harbor seals I picked up. And I put it to the side, and I couldn't find another bag. I asked what it was. I said, well, that's the bag. It was a fresh harbor seal pump. Now, the person in the, in the agency, and the name will remain nameless, um, actually was quite embarrassed because he had not looked in the bag, but he had hired temporary folks that were there to monitor the harbor seal pumping, and they brought it in. I said, well, you better check and see what they're actually looking at. This is uh, certainly a harbor seal pump. So sometimes it's really surprising uh, what uh, people think is a sea otter. Now, I've got this picture up here, this drawing. Does anybody recognize who drew it? Audubon. Audubon. Now we mostly think of Audubon as far as the word Audubon, and we think of his pictures as being relatively accurate representations of those species. Unfortunately, with sea otters, he kind of missed the mark. And this particular picture uh, actually is still continuing to influence people today. Most of you may not have seen it before, but I'll tell you why at the, at the end of this. What is a problem with this picture? What, what kinds of things do we not expect to see in this picture? Okay, I heard out there that there's a fish. Yeah. Okay, he's hauled out. Now, otters do haul out of the water. They can haul out on offshore rocks, and in Alaska and in Russia, uh, they haul out large groups frequently on, on haul-out beaches, but they typically are in this kind of a pose. And they certainly aren't eating, usually only eating in the water. Um, I also like his paws, which look like kind of fingers on here, and I kind of like these fangs kind of sticking out there, making them a little, <laughs> a little vicious. Now otherwise, it doesn't look too bad in any other features. So why is this? Well, at the time he drew this, sea otters were almost extinct. And I'm very confident that he never saw a sea otter in the wild. And so he was probably using skins and uh, information he had to do the best he could. And uh, some of this resembles, the head resembles a river otter more than a sea otter. And so he did his best. In, in the 1800s when this came out, this is probably what, the only thing that people saw was a sea otter. And this is they took home. This is what a sea otter is. And I, I kind of thought about it on the way over here, too, and maybe he was thinking, you know, they're almost extinct. Who's going to check? <laughs> <laughs> um, fortunately, we do still have sea otters today. And uh, the reason I say it's still relevant, this picture, is that I um, visited the Smithsonian not too long ago. Uh, I don't know why in D.C. And uh, we had arranged, when I was with Fish for them to get a dead sea otter so they could mount it uh, and put it in, into their collection. And how many have been to the Smithsonian since they put their new mammal exhibit up? You've been over there? Did you see the sea otter? Do you remember it? It looked like this. <laughs> when, I, when, the, when the guy took me to the exhibit, one of the curators, he says, yeah, I want to show you what we did with the otter. And so I looked at it and I kind of took a second look <laughs> I mean, it's the world's problem. You know, is there a problem? I said, well, this isn't typically the pose we see them. Unfortunately, they didn't put a fish with them. But um, at the same time, uh, this pose was used in this concern. So it continues to influence what people think sea otters are. Now, of course, sea otters look more like this. And I brought in, as you probably saw when you came in, a stuffed otter. This otter is named Ollie uh, by the Fish and Wildlife Service folks that I. Him from. 
Uh, he died of natural causes, so nobody went out and shot him and stuffed him. I just need to make sure everyone wants to know what his name is and whether he died because we shot him or something. He didn't. But otters, um, as in contrast to what um, we have in the Audubon picture, you can see some of the key characteristics of this both up here and in the picture. Most often you're going to see them swimming in the water on their back, which is a more normal pose. Uh, they have rear flippers on the, the rear flippers, and then the front, the paws, in contrast to those kind of fingery type claws at the Audubon, you have a very kitten-like paw and semi-retractable claws. Um, and uh, let's see, what else? There's a key characteristic on here, and one of the ones I always ask for when someone says, I saw a Sierra out there on the beach. So what did it have a tail? This tail right here. You won't see that on the seals or the sea lions. So if you come across an animal, you're dead on the beach, and it's um, apparently what you think is a sea otter, but sometimes you find it on the beach and the pieces are missing, you can look for the tail. If it's got a tail, it's a good chance it's a sea otter. If it's swimming on its back in the water, it's a good chance it's a sea otter. Uh, but we get amazing tales of, of uh, sea otters in the most unlikely places, and most of them are wrong, including one that uh, someone that I know said they're convinced the person that reported it, and they had the right thing, and it was a cow. <laughs> and I don't know how that happened. <laughs> On the other hand, there's, there's the other extreme where I had a, a gentleman from the Harvard Master's Office up in Santa Barbara, and uh, he, was, uh, he called in an otter near Rincon Island. And I said, well, what made you think of otter? it was an otter? He says, well, it just looked like an otter. And, you know, I slowed down to 55 as I was going by, and I'm sure it was. <laughs> so that drive-by sighting was actually, I, I decided to go up and look, and there was an otter there. So I can go both ways. So if you want to impress your friends, look for some of these characteristics, and you can tell uh, others uh, what a sea otter is. And I know some of you are in the naturalist core. How many are in the naturalist core here? Great. Thanks for coming. Uh, you're in a position to talk to a lot of folks, and you can bring some of this information out to them. So please pass it along, because it's awfully um, frustrating when you're trying to track sea otters and you have a lot of stray information around. Now, we typically get our information, you know, at Audubon's time, we had a picture in a book. Now, we can go, and these high school students, or middle school students, I'm not sure which, or have a sea otter pelt. And that's oftentimes all you get, and you try and draw a picture of what a sea otter is in the sea otter pelt. A little tough. Or you can read books, but it's not always as interesting as, as uh, actually getting out into the field. And this is a picture of us up in Washington State uh, getting ready to capture sea otters. So I've had the opportunity to actually get up close and personal with otters. And actually, when you're actually hunting an animal, and I in the sense of trying to capture it, you get to really know it. Uh, so I'm going to share as much information as I have with you tonight, um, very basic information, um, which I hope you will enjoy. So my next basic question, how big is a sea otter? <coughs> now, a lot of people think of a sea otter as something about this size. This pup right here, and it is a pup, is about six weeks old. Okay. It's nice and cute and cuddly. It's everything that we think an otter should be. Ollie here is, a, is an adult animal, but sub-adult. It's probably around 35 to 40 pounds uh, when he was alive. It doesn't weigh that now with the core he's got in there. Uh, but otters can get much bigger. This otter right here is probably about 90 pounds. This otter right here is probably in the 85 pounds. And a little bit bigger than the veterinarian that was just going to work on him. The record otter is 110 pounds from Washington State, so roughly twice or more the size of the otter that we have up here. So most people think of them being small, and actually they're much larger than that. Uh, again, it, it comes into ID because uh, we had someone call in uh, from a harbor master's office in a city to the south of us, they said we had an otter, and we got it picked up, and it was a muskrat. And I thought, well, <laughs> otters aren't that big. I never saw what this was. They never seen a muskrat before. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, do otters eat a lot? Yes. 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 Is it true or false? 
Okay. Yes. They eat a lot. So much so that they've been accused of uh, perhaps eating California as it is represented in this picture. <laughs> if we get too many otters, they'll eat the whole state. Any fishermen in here? Okay, you're a recreational fisherman? Are you a commercial fisherman? <laughs> commercial fishermen are not particularly fond of sea otters because of direct competition with certain shellfish. You know, I mentioned that they didn't eat fish, but I failed to mention is they primarily shellfish, and things like sea urchins, uh, abalone, uh, and um, abalone and clams, and crabs, and if they had a chance lobster if they're in Southern California, and so on. So they do eat a lot. And then the next question becomes, well, will they cause other species to become extinct? And that's come up several times when I uh, have talked about sea otter translocation, moving. We're going to take one endangered species or a whole bunch of other endangered species. Well, I've got a picture here. Uh, this is from San Nicolas Island. And this is a midden site on San Nicolas Island. This is, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of abalone shells in here. Just, just fill. Of course, midden sites are, are essentially refuse piles, but they're not really refuse piles because we do have burials within those uh, piles as well, so we can't just call them a heap of trash because they have other, other purposes. But at the same time, you can get a good feel for the diet of the people that were living there um, at least a thousand years ago in this case. Now, there's a lot of abalone shells there. And presumably, there were otters there as well. This is before the European hunting came. So how could this be? How could you have all these abalone and you could have otters at the same time? I still don't know the answer to that question, so maybe you can help me out sometime. If anybody knows the answer to that, I would like to know. I'll that up because uh, you know, we have other species of abalone down here that are now very rare. This, this uh, abalone right here is a white abalone. White abalone are listed as endangered now in Southern California, or well, the, the whole state for that matter. And uh, the question becomes, will sea otters cause the extinction of white abalone if they expand into the area where white abalone are? Probably not. And here's why. There's not very many white abalone left. Otters eat a lot of different things. White abalone live in very deep water, generally. Most otters are foraging in water 60 feet or less. So the chance of encountering one because they're so rare is, is there, as well as the fact that they're normally outside range of the feeding of the sea otter. Nevertheless, they, if they encounter the white abalone, I'm sure they would like to eat it. So one endangered species eat another one always causes for an interesting story. Now, I just talked briefly about you know this dynamic with otters eating abalone and shellfish and so on, and they eat a lot. Eat so much that they have a profound impact on the environment or influence on the environment. This is just a picture of kelp up off the central coast. As you can see, it's very thick. The common paradigm is, and a very common example of ecology, is that sea otters eat species that are eating kelp. And so they eat those species and the kelp can survive. Uh, and they grow to lush kelp forests, which create habitat for other species like fish. Well, yeah. That's true. Now, I think most of you have been out to the Channel Islands, or at least I hope you have. Is there kelp out there? Yeah. Are there otters out there? Yeah. Well, occasionally, you're right, occasionally there can be an otter out there. But the fact is that kelp can survive without otters. Why is that? There's other species that eat the kelp? Excellent. Very good. You're absolutely right. It's not black and white. There's lobsters eat urchins, sunflowers, sea stars eat urchins and other uh, predators of kelp or other herbivores of kelp. And so, you know, it's it's not it's all sorts of shades of gray. But it is clear that otters will change the environment that they're in. In the central coast, you would not find an abalone like this. Okay, this is a very large abalone. This happens to be a green abalone, which is a southern species. I got it at San Nicolas Island. Um, and it's very large. 
when you're, when you're in an area where there's sea otters, there are abalone there. In fact, they're quite abundant. But if you find one that is this size, you're finding a big one up there. But this size, they've been breeding probably for about five years already. So it changes the, the sea otters, the predation of sea otters will change the demographics of the population, meaning it change the size, uh, you know, what's the largest size of some of them. It will also change the numbers. But will it cause their extinction? Well, so far, we don't have any evidence that sea otters have caused the extinction of any species. And in fact, they have, uh, actually, they, they may increase the biodiversity in the area because they're cutting competition down. So, sea otters are an important part of the ecosystem. Whether some folks like it or not, that's really, I think, the, the reality of it. Okay. Yes, question. Yeah, do they uh, help control the uh, sea urchin population? Which Certainly. Out of, or out of whack or anything like that? Yeah, out of whack is an interesting concept. What is really out of whack mean? We have a, we say what is out of, we say that it's out of whack because we think it's uh, some way or another. But they do affect sea urchin populations so much so that you may find an area in Southern California here in the Channel Islands that is considered an urchin barren area. Urchin barren area means it's barren except for urchins. It's just urchins on the bottom. And in some of these areas, those are pretty prolific fishing grounds for the fishermen. You would not see that area in an area where otters have been uh, established for a long time. Urchins is one of their favorite prey items, and they will go after them preferentially over other species. So, yes. They will affect and they do change uh, and, and uh, keep in balance or in check uh, urchin populations if you want to call, uh, if you want to go that route. I, I keep that to be cautious because what we think is the right balance, who are we to know? Uh, what we can do is try and, and duplicate or keep the species in play that were there historically or you know, we were there in the past and we're trying to bring them back or keep them all there so that they can interact in whatever cycles they interact in. By the way, feel free to ask questions anywhere along the way because I will be happy to stop and entertain those questions. This is really to be an interactive forum and not just me. I've just got some guidelines here to kind of generate some thought-provoking questions and we'll go from there. So, I have this other basic question. Do sea otters die? And this, this sounds like an odd question, right? He's dead, I think, yeah. Um, so, sea otters certainly do die, but why did I put this question up here? Well, sometimes we forget that. Um, sea otters can die of a lot of things, but um, at San Nicolas Island, and I have a lot, so many examples and stories from San Nicolas Island, uh, we were tracking the otters, we took out the San Nicolas Island, and we were trying to keep track of what happened to them. Some of them swam away. There's a few that died at the island. There's some that swam away and ended up in Southern California and were captured and moved back to the Central Coast for a variety of reasons. And then we had uh, some animals that swam to the Central Coast and then they died sometime later. Often people are very interested. We created a table for our reports and they really want to know how many were dead. Well, I'm here to tell you right now that translocation started about 20 years ago and I'm pretty confident that all those otters are People are go, what do you mean? They're all dead. They're all dead. Well, they're all dead because they live about 15 to 20 years normally. Just like us, we have a limited time to spend uh, in our environment. But there's also a lot of other things that otters die from. And um, I just want to touch on a couple that are a little more unusual. So this is an x-ray of a sea otter. And what do you think this is? Give you a close up. A tooth. It looks like a tooth, doesn't it? Actually, this is what happened to its bone right here. This otter was nicknamed Stumpy because he had one, one uh, arm shorter than the other. He was, uh, he was watched for a long time before he eventually died and then uh, they found this through the x-ray of this. And this is a bullet. C 
Sailors do get shot. You know, some people deny it. No, no one ever sort to the cute, poor, cute little otter. We have many otters that do get shot. It is fortunately rare as far as how many that we find. Um, but they do get shot from time to time. I think the maximum any given year was six that we're aware of. Uh, but usually it's anywhere from zero to two or three that we get. And even in some places where you'd expect sea otters to be loved, like in Monterey, you get shot sea otters. But shooting of sea otters is not a common event as far as we can tell. And I have to keep putting that caveat because maybe somebody's you know, hiding the evidence. Um, but um, fortunately it is rare. Uh, I spent some time up in Russia and uh, we had some, uh, we looked at a lot of otters up there and there's, there's a lot of them. And it seems like they live longer, but look at their teeth. There's lots of cavities. Kids, are you looking at this? Do you know about flossing? <laughs> they do floss your teeth? You do? It's good because you don't want it to even get worse because there's this guy over here and he's lost most of these teeth. In fact, it's just really odd because most of the animals that we caught up there had really bad teeth. So, don't forget to floss. Don't eat rocks. Don't eat hard items. But the fact is that they have a hard life out there, they're eating shellfish, and they can uh, lose their teeth. Bill? Uh, Chris, I was wondering if the teeth uh, determine that how long they live when the teeth wear out, do they, they die, or do they die from other things first? Well, that's a good question. Um, it can be both. Um, the, in Southern California, we found some very old males and their teeth were pretty much worn down with the gums. And they were way down here, perhaps because there was more food availability or maybe they could find something softer to eat, like some crabs. So they do persist for a long time, even with such bad teeth. These animals that I'm showing here otherwise look pretty healthy. Their teeth were really bad. Um, so they could survive with these bad teeth. Uh, but they could lead to their death. And in fact, uh, sometimes they get infections and some of the heart problems we see in sea otters could be from bacteria, from the teeth themselves being rotted. Um, so it can lead to their death. Um, or um, in some cases, they will die of something else uh, before they do um, lose their teeth. Yeah. Yeah, how much older do these Alaskan uh, otters get and uh, do they get bigger? Uh, this, these are actually Russian otters. In, in um, the, uh, Russia, Alaska, same thing. I think last year I said you could see uh, Russia from Alaska. Um, but boy, so many people still remember that quote. She had a great quote. <laughs> okay. Um, so what really determines the size um, is availability of food. And both in, in, in Russia, in many parts of Alaska, there's fairly high densities of sea otters. And they're growing into these medium size to uh, maybe, uh, they're generally 40 to 50 pounds in the females and 60 to 70 pounds in the males. Uh, that record animal I told you about came from Washington State. Washington State uh, has got a small population of sea otters that originated from a translocation from Alaskan sea otters, same stock. Uh, but because, presumably because they have uh, more than abundant food resources, they've gotten very big. Same thing we saw at San Nicolas Island. Um, those animals that we took to San Nicolas Island right now, by the way, for those tracking it, um, the originals are probably all dead still. But we have offspring there, and we have about 40 animals at San Nicolas Island right now. Um, some of the, we did some captures a while back, and there were, um, mothers with 30 pound pups. Now a 30 pound pup, and they were still dependent, usually they're weaned at 20 pounds. So we're presuming that the same age as what would be normally a 20 pound pup, in the, but they're just big babies. Uh, so we're, we, we've seen that, and then some of the uh, animals are larger out there too. Again, probably related to quality of food and amount of food. Uh, how old is the oldest skeleton of a sea otter that has been found. And I'm, I'm just curious about their teeth. Uh, if that's changed um, the, stru the structure, the strength of their teeth um, over the decades, 
because of their, the diet I assume has always been the same, but is what they're eating has that, the, 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 um, the chemical balance, but that's not quite what I want, the nutritional balance of what they're eating. Would that be different than what, say, 200 years ago? Well, that's a very good question. I really don't know the answer to that. We could look into some of the uh, midden records to see what we have available for sea otters and maybe look at that. That would be a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know if we've changed uh, the environment or the environment has changed to, to cause some of these, but probably not. It's probably in relation to uh, how hard they have to work to eat. You know, the, the um, the animals I told you at San Nicholas Island, um, this may play into what you were talking about, though. It was very interesting. We had um, some bad teeth there in younger animals, and, and we don't know why that was the case. And in fact, one of the animals we caught in one of these traps, which I'll be talking about a little bit, um, I actually caught her with a 30-pound pup, and she grabbed onto the side, and she bit so hard that she broke her whole upper jaw. Now, fortunately, the veterinarian that we had out there with us that was doing the surgical implants had worked with military dogs. And uh, in military dogs, for their training, often they get that type of a break when they're training and you know they're twisting on a, you know, a padded arm or something like that. And so he had experience with repairing that type of wound, which is an amazing um, wound. She, she did very well. She was tracked for the next two or three years after that, and uh, she got the nickname Jawbreaker. And um, she did okay. Um, but it was amazing that you know the, the, she actually broke her jaw in the attempt to try and get away. And some of those teeth were really bad at San Nicolas Island and otters that didn't look that old. So don't know. Don't know what they're doing to eat, what they're eating to get that. Now, I mentioned sea otters, sea otters eat things like urchins and abalone and clams and uh, fat innkeeper worms, all sorts of different things. Uh, but not all otters seemingly are eating the same things. At San Nicolas Island, they seem to all eat the same things. They love urchins and crabs. But in the mainland range, where there's a lot of otters, some may be eating urchins and crabs, some may be eating snails, some may be eating something else. And it's a great adaptation for having more otters in one area where they're not competing against each other for the same food. Uh, so that's, that's just another little interesting thing with sea otters. Okay, so I've had this gory picture up here long enough. So how do we know so much and so little about sea otters? Well, first we need to do a lot of looking at them. And this is me looking through a telescope this is a Questar telescope, and that's typically how we would look at sea otters. But you can't really tell each sea otter apart very well unless it's stumpy, it has a very unusual arm, or if it's uh, you know got some other unusual characteristics. So we have to, to be able to do some of these studies, we have to really look at tagging them. And we can tag them by tagging their rear flippers. This is what the tags look like. And unfortunately, I don't have one to put on, on um, our little Ollie here. But I wanted to point out that if you can see this, I'm going to top this so I can speak a little bit. Okay, so if you look at the, uh, look at the toes, and he's dropping his food. Right <laughs> um, we have, in sea otters, five toes, just like we do, on each foot. If you look, the shorter toes on the inside, the longer toes on the outside. So we can put a tag between this toe and this toe, which we call the one and the two position. And we can put another one on the one and two position. So we put a red one here and a white one here. So that would be red one, two, white one, two. But then you can put it in between different digits or different colors, and you can see that you have a lot of different combinations. So that's one way we tag on it. Actually, all otters that are tagged are tagged in the same way. And we. Um, we can then tell from a distance which otter is which. Now, tags are on the outside and they can chew them off. We really can't put them anyplace else because otters can really reach every part of their skin. Why would they want to touch every part of their skin? To keep their fur clean. 
because this is how they're keeping warm. So they can stretch that fur from their back all the way around the front and, and really groom it. Um, so we can't put anything on the outside that would interfere with their uh, insulation of their fur. And you know when we put it on their flippers, they can still chew it. So we actually have some other tags that we use on some animals which are implanted in them. <clears throat> and I brought one of them here. This is a picture of an implant to this for a sea otter. And this is an actual one that came out of one of our otters. What's the first thing that you think when you see this? Big. Everybody says that. It's big. And it is, it does appear big. Uh, but we've had great success in putting these in. They, they actually, it sounds a little weird, floats around in the abdominal cavity. Uh, but the radio signal that's sent out with this lasts about two years. And using a radio uh, telemetry, you can actually find the animals, know exactly who that is by the frequency, and be able to collect data on that animal. So this is one of the ways we collect information. Now there's another instrument up here which has been really helpful for understanding sea otters, and it's a smaller instrument. It's also planted in the, in the abdomen, and that's a time depth recorder. The time depth recorder will record how long dives are and how deep they go. So when we're watching animals and we're doing it by radio, if we want to see how many times they're diving, or we have to only guess how deep they're diving, but we, we have a hard time tracking them. And then at night, you just can't see them at all. This records all their dives for about a year period of time, depending on how you set it up. And that gives us a lot of information. We found out that otters are as active at night as they are in the daytime. They're often foraging at night, just like they are in the day. Um, we find out that the deepest dive up in Alaska was nearly 300 feet deep. But most of the dives, by far the majority, are less than 60 feet deep. By using this information, we can get an idea of where they're going. And in fact, some of the information is so detailed that you can generally get an idea of what they may be feeding on, certainly in the depth range they're at, but also how long or how many dives, and they can correlate that with some of the visual observations by looking at the radios, and we can get an idea of what they're doing. So a fantastic record. It gives us some really keen information. The surgery, and this is uh, Dr. Murray from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, who's one of the veterinarians that does a lot of the work out here and uh, one of our honors, so we do need to, to, to implant them in. We had great success with this technique. But when we have them, and we've caught them, and we've, you know, we've put the surgery, we can also collect tissue samples, we can collect blood samples, get a lot of information on health. So when I talked about animals dying before, I only t picked up on a couple of things. There's teeth problems uh, in some animals there, um, of course, some, very few get shot, as far as we can tell. But what is causing the death in most animals? Some of you have seen my presentation before. What is probably the main cause of death, general cause of death in sea otters? Predation. Okay, well, I heard a lot of things. I heard chemical poisoning. No, we don't really have much evidence for chemical poisoning, even though our environment certainly is deteriorated since over time. It's a little bit degraded. We, and they do load contaminants. It doesn't seem to be affecting them as far as we can tell. I heard parasites. Parasites or general disease is the biggest cause of death. And we're looking at through work up at, at Santa Cruz, California Cloud and Fishing Games Facility, looking at what the, was causing the death and all sorts of interesting things about disease and the connection between those diseases and the shore. You know, this is the Shore to Sea Lecture Series. You know, the disease is traveling from the shore to the sea, so it fits. Um, but we do see parasites, protozoal parasites, microscopic parasites that lodge in the brain, which are affecting otters that come from either domestic or wild cats, and possums. <coughs> Interesting stuff. I have to go into detail on those. Now, I also heard predation out there, and that was a good answer as well. Uh, a good friend of mine, Brian Hadfield, who keeps track of all the records, has really been looking at the numbers closely, and about a third of the animals up in the north coast are shark bitten. White sharks. White sharks. But we're, we're finding a lot of these on the beach, so why is that the case? Probably because 
Uh, it's not that sea otters can evade white sharks very well. They're not very big compared to an elephant seal, which is a normal prey item for a white shark. But they may be just mistaken identity. Shark, for whatever reason, doesn't eat them. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't find many of those. Um, it's just another interesting thing. Maybe sharks think they're not fatty enough. It's not like a good, juicy elephant seal. Or um, perhaps it's a fur and it doesn't want to get a fur ball, whatever. <laughs> the animals seem to be um, not necessarily surviving the attack, but their body remains after the attack, so they're not being consumed. So it's kind of a predation, but not really. Where did you say that was happening? Along the north coast, oh. in particular, California. But we're seeing it in Southern California, or Southern end of the range right now as well. Are there many otters north of the Golden Gate yet? No. No. Right now, the range is pretty much up to Half Moon Bay. Uh, we do have extraluminal sightings uh, north of the San Francisco Bay and Point Reyes and so on. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they get up there, but they haven't really expanded that far up to the north. We talked earlier about the animals being really big, particularly out of San Diego Island. Are they proportionately big, or San Nicolas, are they proportionately big, or are they overweight too? They're uh, actually proportionally big as well. So, you know, I've also kind of, maybe you're getting at this, I was thinking maybe they're growing so fast that their teeth are kind of weak because there's just so much growth well, growing so fast. Things, so like um, well, that's a good question. I don't know, you know, there's blood samples been taken from those animals on a whole variety of tests. I have never heard of diabetes in a sea otter, but that's an interesting question. I don't, um, I should ask somebody. Yeah, maybe they have a fatty liver and, So we can look a little bit closer at, at things. We can also look at captive animals. Now where do all our captive sea otters come from? Does anyone know? Russia. Russia, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I heard cotton nets, injuries. Most of the animals that we have in captivity that you see like at the Long Beach Aquarium or at the Monterey Bay Aquarium or at aquariums in Washington State, the Aquarium of America is down in uh, Louisiana, uh, were all pups that were abandoned by their moms for whatever reason. They got separated in a storm, or uh, something happened and they got abandoned. And in many cases, the Monterey Bay Aquarium has attempted to rehab those animals and try and get them out into the wild again. And we just plain made terrible otter parents. They just don't seem to get it. So some of those end up in captivity uh, because they just can't get away from people after being raised by people, even when they wore masks and tried to isolate them and tried to teach them how to swim right with wetsuits and the big tide pool in front. A lot of those things that just haven't worked. So we find that these uh, pups are really not able to survive in the wild, so oftentimes we're looking for places to, to house them. Now we don't have many places to house them, so in some cases the pups are euthanized because there's just no place to put them. It's very sad, but they would have died on the beach, so um, some purists would say, you know, let them die a natural death on the beach, but somehow when there's a seagull kind of pecking at them, uh, people don't like to see that, so they're brought in. This particular animal, he was also a rehab. His name is Morgan. And I think some of you may have heard of Morgan uh, in a previous talk I had, but he had very unusual behaviors with harbor seals, and since not everyone's over the age, a certain age, I don't want really to get into the details, but he uh, basically was uh, implicated in the killing of several harbor seals, and he's now in captivity with no chance of parole. Um, and so we can learn things from him. Um, things we're learning about their hearing capability, some of their learning behaviors, and so on. So we can learn some things from the captive animals. But how do you catch an animal? That's my last thing I'm going to talk about because I'm really interested in that. I was out there hunting sea otters. To all of this research, you actually have to get a hold of them. Um, one of the more common techniques now involve uh, a trap like we have up here. Now this is upside down. This is what the otter's perspective is on a trap if they happen to look down when I was coming up at them. Um, but there's several different ways we can catch sea otters. 
I just mentioned the diving method. We have an underwater vehicle and a trap, and then we have the, uh, this is a special type of diving equipment, a closed circuit oxygen rebreather that we use to sneak up in the outers. It basically allows us to go without bubbles, typically used in a military type application. The other ways we catch them is with nets, either a tangling net or a giant dip net that's used for salmon. Now that giant dip net, how do you get one of those? You notice it's kind of a flat bottom boat, it's a Boston whaler. Well, you just go ahead and you run really fast at them and then you just grab them out of the water. It's kind of a rodeo style approach. Uh, and it was used actually quite effectively for catching animals that were taken to San Nicolas Island. Uh, up off the San Simeon area, many animals are captured with this method. Um, I think it tends to favor animals that are a little bit not all there, all together there, so maybe that was one of the problems we had with San Nicolas animals. <laughs> Um, so anyway, uh, they're, they're typically animals out in open water. They're not inside a kelp bed, so you can actually zoom up really fast and get them. Are they dangerous when you catch them? Oh, good question. Those little cute teddy bears of the sea, you think they're dangerous? Yes. Well, I got a skull here. And, uh, you know, there's some teeth on there. They're not quite the fangs that uh, Audubon put on them. But at the same time, they have very sharp teeth, very strong jaws, and like any animal that's captured, they generally want to get away. And um, they can um, can be little mini Tasmanian devils in this trap. I've had some of my colleagues have been bitten. I got bit on the knee when I was trying to separate a mom with a pup. I couldn't, I couldn't blame her for that. She took a chunk out of the knee and it was okay. Fortunately, most of my wetsuit went with it not my leg, which was good. So yes, um, they can be kind of uh, touchy when you when you get them. And I just actually heard a story just recently, a friend of mine uh, that I dive with for sea otter captures was diving up in Alaska recently. And typically when we go up and we're getting up under one of these otters sneaking up with this trap, you know, the first thing they want to do is just get away. So if, if you miss them, they just kind of swim away. Sometimes you want to look at you kind of funny. You go, What's that? You know, and they kind of back away. Well, this friend of mine was up in Alaska, and there was this big male otter up there, and he missed it, and it was looking down at him. So he thought, well, I'm going to try and catch him. So he goes over there. That otter was not just looking down at him. He went after him. And he started biting his hand and did his hand up pretty good. And he was kind of fighting for his hand. I won't say his life, because uh, it would still be kind of get hard to get killed by this year. But um, anyway, uh, that was a very unusual, um, but at the same time, I guess I can't blame the otter for doing that. Um, I, I wondered myself, I was under a group of about uh, 80 otters once, and they were all big ones up in Washington State. And they all scattered, and I was thinking, if these guys knew what they could do to me, I'd be in big trouble. <laughs> Fortunately, they all swam away. So, um, catching sea otters is, um, uh, I was going to say on the entangling nets right here, on the entangling nets, now you can just set a net like you would a fishing net and you can catch an otter. But it's really hard to recapture them. Why would we want to recapture them? Well, I mentioned some of those instruments, that time depth recorder, you actually have to get it back out, surgically removed to get the data. So we would go ahead and we have to recapture the same animals. Now those capture animals have been captured once, sometimes they might kind of have a clue as what's going on. Most of the time we don't think they really have a clue, they kind of forget about it. But at the same time, it's very difficult to get one to go in the same net, you know, a second time, uh, even if you set it right in front of them. So we actually sneak up from them. So how do we sneak up from them? I'll take you on a dive and how we do it. Uh, first of all, we usually have someone on shore that's looking through one of those telescopes I showed you earlier for the otters for us. They call us on the boat and they say, hey, we've got an otter over there. It's one of our tagged ones. We want you to catch it. So we sneak up over there with our boat usually one of those flat bottom Boston weather boats. We get closer, we go slower. We go from the downwind side because they can smell us. And it's not just because we smell bad, I think it's the exhaust in the boat, but I'll, I'll use that excuse. So we come up from the downwind side, we get lower and lower in the boat so they don't see us. We take off our orange jackets because we're afraid they're gonna see us. And we quietly tie up to some kelp or quietly drop the anchor over. And then we get our dive gear on, we get in the water, and we navigate underwater towards the animals that are resting. 
Well, sometimes the otter we want is with a group of otters. And we can't see those tags underwater, so it's kind of tough. And I was just in Russia a year ago, and uh, we had a group of literally about 100 animals. They said, yeah, it's right in the middle. <laughs> Next to the three that are in a row and the two that are over here, <laughs> we still have to try. So we go over there and we get over there and we get underneath. We don't have any bubbles, so they're not seeing us. And we see all these otters above us. And how do you figure which out? You just have to make a guess and you go for it. We usually have two divers, uh, sometimes three. And we'll push our traps up at the same time and try and catch as many in that general area and, and hopefully get the one that we wanted. Now, that skill takes a little while to develop, and um, I'll share with you my experience when I first started. I was a new sea otter diver. I had gotten the training. I hadn't really caught many sea otters yet. And I was at Anacapa Island, and we had one of our otters that came from San Nicolas and up at Anacapa that we wanted to recapture. After about two days of trying to capture him, I was right underneath him. I pushed my trap up. I pushed him in, he fell into the trap, and wow, I caught him. He's there. Oops, I didn't have the string to pull it closed. He just swam right back up. <laughs> and I probably kicked myself for a couple weeks because it took me uh, about 23 more days of work out there before I got him in the same position and caught him. This time when I pulled it, I think I strained my arm and it hurt it for about three weeks because I was playing so hard. But anyway, it takes a little time to develop the skill, and um, there's actually just a few folks that are doing it, and I don't know what happens now. All of us are getting older, and, and we're not replacing with younger divers, so um, who knows how long we'll be catching otters at this rate. So uh, this is uh, one of the new rebreathers that I was using for a while. It gets complicated, and I was hoping to express that it's a little complicated catching sea otters. Um, as, and it's just, just not quite as simple. So hopefully this gave you a little bit more information about <laughs> sea otters. And I noticed that we have a nice seagull display over here. <laughs> and fortunately I have the seagulls over here. This is what they're really saying. They're saying there are more questions, but how much longer do I need to sit here? <laughs> so uh, with that, I'll open it up to general questions and uh, be happy to answer any you have. We'll take a few questions and then I'll break and I'll stay for anyone that wants to answer, ask more questions, uh, but I want to make sure there's an opportunity for people to escape and don't feel that they have to sit here a little time. So thank you very much. <laughs> hey, a question over here. Yeah, just a question on the scuba gear that's um, bubbleless. Is that pure oxygen or is it air? The re Actually, the rebreather that I uh, showed you first was a pure oxygen rebreather. And for those of you that are divers out there, you uh, probably know that if you don't really use oxygen in those tanks, it's air in those tanks. Uh, but by using pure oxygen, we can take small takes with us, and we're limited in depth. Our maximum depth is 25 feet. So by, by having a maximum depth, we can dive safely with pure oxygen. Now, sometimes, uh, I just to, to, to diverge a little bit, <laughs> Sometimes people think, oh, you're breathing pure oxygen, it's under pressure, and, and I don't know if you remember Michael Jackson might have slept in a hyperbaric chamber with pure oxygen to keep you from anger. But you know, I'm 102 years old, and I don't think it made any difference at all. <laughs> so, you know, there's nothing to that hyperbaric oxygen business. Uh, but anyway, uh, then other people think, oh, you feel really good when you're, like, no, it doesn't make any difference. Um, it's just, just like breathing the air, but we do have severe limitations in how we can use it. The more complicated one I showed you was a mixed gas rebreather, so I mixed it with air, and so it's a really a nitrox mixture, and you can dive much deeper with that. Let me, any, oh, did you have a question down here? I want to give someone else a chance, I'll get back to you. Yeah. Okay, how many hours are left in the world, but really what the percentage of the world population is left? Well, um, I'll answer in a couple ways. In California, uh, we think that there are probably about 16,000 otters historically in California, and we have about 2,800 right now. So what is the percentage on that? Somebody do the math. Uh, 15 uh, it's about uh, 
it's less than 20 percent, 15 15 percent of the population in California. Now otters have done much better up in Alaska, uh, but until recently, in some areas of Alaska, Southwest Alaska in particular, there have been some major population decreases out there, so much so that that stock has been listed as threatened. Um, but uh, it's believed that the world population is probably around 200,000 otters, and there's probably about 130,000 up in Alaska, and of course there are 2,000 here. Uh, and well, that was the U.S. population. There's some in Russia too, and down the other side. Um, and I'm not sure what the total number is, but we're probably looking between 200 and 250,000 was the estimated world population throughout the entire North Pacific. It went all the way from halfway down Baja, up the entire West Coast, to like now the United States and Canada, through Alaska, into Russia, into the Northern Islands of Japan. So, so they're all in the North Pacific, all sea Yeah, North Pacific, it's restricted to the North Pacific. Yes. Now there's another otter, this is a quiz, another otter that's uh, called the marine otter. Where is that from? Good, it's on the, it's, it's on the west coast of South America, up and down the entire west coast there. So there's a, it's a small otter, it looks much more like a river otter though, but it is uh, generally considered um, restricted to the marine environment. It has some similar behaviors to otter, but it probably hasn't gone into the marine environment um, as robustly as, as uh, sea otters in, in the North Pacific, meaning that they haven't made the adaptations. If you see a sea otter out of the water, like we just saw, and you see them try to move, it's very awkward looking. They have a very arched back, their spine is very arched, and they look like an inch line moving along. And they look very awkward when they're out of the water and they're trying to move. They can be out of the water, and if you go to the aquarium, um, either, uh, well, you can probably see the aquarium Pacific where they have a display set up on water, right? If you see them out there out of the water, you'll see that they're moving much different than you might think. By the way, river otters, can go into the ocean. So oftentimes I hear folks say, oh, well, I saw a bunch of sea otters up in Trinidad in California. Or I was on the web one time and I said, they said, oh, there's some sea otters up in the Strait de Juan de Fuca. And I thought, well, that's interesting because we have some on the outer coast of Washington, but not in the inner. And I thought, oh, well, I should check out that report. And they have a picture of these river otters on a rock. So river otters can go into the marine environment and take advantage of that sometimes. but. Uh, uh, it fools some folks. Okay, yes? Are you planning any more relocation <coughs> programs than the other islands or anything? There's no translocation programs that I'm aware of that anyone is, um, anyone is proposing. The, the last translocation we had was this translocation in California where we moved a group from Central California to San Nicolas Island. We took 140 sea otters out over about a three year period. After about three years after the last release, we had about um, eight left, um, and a lot of them left, and it was just not thought to have succeeded. Now, we do have a group of about 40 otters there, so in that sense, it's been a success, uh, but certainly not what was anticipated. Um, moving around sea otters is highly politically charged um, because of the conflict with fisheries. Uh, up in um, British Columbia, where they have uh, Population that resulted from a translocated population from Alaska. Um, they've been they developed a recovery plan, and they're actually looking at translocation as a means to avoid conflicts, maybe zoning, managing sea otters like we proposed here in California. But you know, I it's been my experience that uh, we probably can't tell the otters where they're going to go. They usually go where they want to go, and no matter how many environmental impact statements we write, we can't seem to get them to get it. They're not supposed to do this. Um, but we have some very interesting stories that I told previously in the translocation presentations. Um, otters can swim great distances and, and uh, come back to where they originally were from. So, anyway, the answer is no. I'm not aware of any translocations being proposed, certainly in the United States, and I don't think Canada is really seriously looking at it at this point. Back. Could you address their social behavior and the, their paws or whatever it's called? Well, what is a group of otters called? A raft. A raft. Very good. You've been studying the otters. <laughs> a raft of sea otters. And uh, they have very interesting social behavior. They're very gregarious. They like to hang out with other otters. Females will tend to gather together in groups. Uh, sometimes females with pups um, will be together. 
Seldom do you see a group of males mixed with females, but you may see one male kind of off to the side of the females over near him. Um, males.